started. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our pre-Thanksgiving day or week meeting. Um, happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Um, and Michael, uh, it's good to have you in the house. Uh, we were confused. We thought you were here. A couple people walked by without even looking and saying, hi, Michael. Um, but the uh, mayor's sitting here, actually, so just for anybody. Uh, uh, we're kind of full around the, around the table. I know um, uh, Mr. Prather is supposed to be here as well. So uh, we haven't demoted Michael. He's just, you know, not around the, the round table, so to speak. So anyway, good to have you. Um, we're going to go ahead and do the pledge. Uh, mayor Hibbard, will you lead us in the pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as you all probably know, and people that are watching, I don't know if you do know, but uh, we have a normal meeting today, probably be a shortened meeting, about an hour, and then we're going to get into some elite funding uh, conversation. I think. Uh, I don't know what, what we'll arrive at today, but at least I hope to have some good conversation about, um, about the program and how you all may want to look at it and change and however. But anyway, it could be a good, robust discussion. We'll try to start that as close to 10 o'clock as possible. Uh, so without further ado, we'll go ahead and jump into the approval of the minutes uh, from the uh, regular meeting and also our, pro our capital project funding workshop. Do so I have moved. Thank you. Motion uh, by uh, Mayor Hibbard and second by uh, Mike Williams. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Um, any public comments? None? Yes. Up oh, there. Okay. Um, I'm going to let you go and come on up and then you can fill out one of the cards afterwards if you don't mind, sir. Great. Good morning and welcome. Uh, state your name and address and you have three minutes. Uh, three minutes? Great. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tony Smith. I run a, a local real estate blog uh, called uh, St. Pete Talk. And I attended last week's meeting, the annual meeting for uh, Visit St. Pete Clearwater. And obviously, you can probably tell by my sheet, my t-shirt, what I'm here to speak about. Um, the annual meeting was, was very well for demonstrating uh, attracting domestic travel and tourism to St. Peter, uh, to St. Pete Clearwater. What was missing and really lacking was the recognition that the snowbird community has contributed to um, our area. And I was a little surprised that uh, six months ago we knew Swoop Airlines was coming in, the airport was changing, and we knew that international travel was coming back. And now with the border opening uh, this last week, um, we anticipate having a lot more snowbird traffic down here. And looking at the presentation, um, good morning, Mr. Hayes. Uh, I noticed that um, there was just so much focus on the U.S. domestic travel, attracting travel from Ohio, Illinois, um, you know, the, mid the Midwest states that we're doing. But there's a significant hole in recognizing the snowbird community. Uh, briefly, you. Um, the Snowbird community has been coming here for about 30 years. Um, their real estate holdings, um, I did my research and looked at real estate. Um, Canadian, uh, Snowbirds pay $19 million a year in taxes. Um, during the pandemic, when the tourist tax dropped to that low point of like 40%, uh, Snowbirds continued to funnel and support this community through their tax. and. I just didn't see that we're prepared to welcome back the Canadians because they have such a rich, uh, a, a really rich history of being here in this area. Um, so I'd like to say, how can we pivot this? And I'd like to suggest to Mr. Hayes, um, one of your slides showed that uh, February, March will be likely the peak tourist season. So if we're gonna attract the Canadian market, now that the border's open, we have Swoop, we basically have two months to recoup, to recoup and recognize the Snowbird's contribution to our community. Um, and also, I'd like to offer my services as far as marketing, because I've been studying basically under the pandemic, where is our Snowbird traffic coming from? 
And yes, you may have highlighted those states in the Northwest or in the Northeast US, but um, Canadians, um, over, through the pandemic, if you look at the 20, 18, 24 months, they've contributed almost $40 million in taxes. And it just kind of got wiped under the rug. And basically in two months, all the snowbirds are gonna come back at the peak. And I don't think we're prepared to welcome them or thank them for their contribution. And that's three minutes. Yeah. Thank you for your Thank, you. Thank you for your comments. Um, I, yeah, I, 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 perhaps in some ways, you know, it's interesting that sometimes we take take for granted uh, uh, those who are that mean so much to us. Um, and um, what's that? Our city needs one of those. Oh. That's pretty <laughs> annoying. <laughs> yeah, stop the talking, please. Yeah. Um, so we do, we do uh, certainly uh, uh, enjoy and understand the impact that our snowbirds have and our tourists have on this community. We always have, in fact, on a, on a very small scale, I know there was a contingent out at the airport welcoming the new, the new uh, maiden voyage of Swoop into our community. So um, uh, certainly recognizing the impact, perhaps we can do a little better job, but we certainly understand the impact that, that, uh, that our visitors have. Um, I know many of us um, uh, embrace that, uh, that element. So, uh, but anyway, thank you for your comments this morning. Uh, anybody else? And uh, did you get a card signed? Okay. Um, all right, well, we'll go ahead and get started with our department updates, uh, Mr. Hayes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. At the last TDC meeting, uh, one of the uh, desires of the group was to get a update on beach renourishment and um, we've asked uh, we actually talked to John Bishop about presenting um, but I think what's whatever crud is going around he had it among <laughs> what with, I was in a meeting yesterday and three people weren't showing up because they had the crud so Kelly um, Hammer is going to be uh, filling in and provide the beach uh, renourishment update for this body and Kelly thank you for doing this oh sure yes uh, I am definitely pinch hitting for John I will I'll caveat this that I'm not going to do as good of a job because he's embedded in this every single day of his life um, but I'll do my best to present the program and answer answer the questions so um, I'm the public works director for the county and the coastal program is is part of our environmental management division just for some context so just a little we're going to go through a little background in history and some of our recent projects i'm going to give an update on the reauthorization of treasure island and long key and how that will impact um, those projects as well as the funding related to those projects an update on sand key which i know you're probably very aware we have a significant challenge there and whether it's going to move forward this cycle or not and then our funding picture and just the the picture there is the first nourishment uh, 1992 indian shores when they used a conveyor belt method of bringing the sand on shore so a little background we have 35 miles of beautiful white sandy beaches here in pinellas county uh, 21.4 miles of those are designated by the state as being critically eroded. Um, so that means they're in the, the beach plan for the state and are eligible for funding when we apply. Uh, 12 miles of those beaches are regularly restored. Um, it involves 12 coordination with 12 of our coastal communities. Um, 10 of those uh, coastal communities have active projects going on. Two do not. Um, that would be um, through our program, meaning um, Madeira Beach, um, which is not part of the federal authorization, and um, Dunedin, because um, typically the state handles the nourishment out on Honeymoon Island with the exception of the big project that occurred uh, several years back. So in kind of looking at those, those federal authorizations, we have San Key, which is authorized through uh, 2043. Uh, Treasure Island um, and Long Key there at the south end are nearing the end of their authorization, which is why we um, worked very hard and, and former County Commissioner John Maroney was really the impetus on, on pushing that initiative forward um, to secure, uh, helping to secure the, uh, you know, the federal work that was necessary to um, to move the reauthorization forward. So um, a big thank you to, to his efforts. Um, the non-federal projects that we have done are Honeymoon Island, that was the tea groin project and the nourishment. 
the state of Florida paid 75% um, of the design um, and the monitoring, and they paid 100% of the construction, but we oversaw that project for them um, that, you know, to make sure that it was constructed properly. And then, of course, um, we funded the tea groins at Upham Beach. Um, that was not part of the federal project, but it does enhance the project and does contribute to um, a much extended length project. The sand stays there much longer now. Uh, the funding picture there, 60, 20, 20, that's just general. It's not exact. Each, each project's a little different, and the state funding piece is, is never guaranteed. It's something we have to apply for on an ongoing basis. So these are some of the recent projects we've completed. Um, you know, the same key nourishment project, the last one was here in 2018. Um, and we did not, uh, you know, do the full nourishment, um, just there were some areas that were skipped because of the easement issue. Uh, Treasure Island and, and Long Key were also nourished um, around that time as well. And Upham stabilization, that, that includes the groin project um, that was substantially completed at the end of 2018. Um, and what we are seeing is that the sand retention out there because of the construction of those groins is much extended, which reduces the costs associated with maintaining that beach. But you can see there's a lot of sand and a lot of money involved in these projects. The most recent sand key project uh, cost nearly uh, 44.5 million. Uh, we, we placed about 1.3 million cubic yards of sand, and I know that's really hard to picture. Um, it was in a huge project, and, and it, because it had uh, both an, its normal nourishment cycle as well as storm damage reduction dollars associated with it due to um, you know, some uh, tropical events and hurricanes that had come through and done additional damage uh, beyond what we were expecting. In Treasure Island, uh, that project included both Sunset and Sunshine Beach at a cost of $7.2 million. And again, Upham, uh, we placed, a, again, a much more reduced amount of sand there, but and at a cost of $3.3 million. And that was all in the 2017-2018 timeframe. And these are just some pictures um, for some perspective here. This was um, uh, pre-nourishment 2017 on Sunset Beach. Um, Sunset is probably one of our most, most critically eroded beaches. Um, this was after the nourishment. Uh, you can see the beach berm is much wider, um, much more significant. And then here we are, October of 2021. And this is even more eroded than the pre-nourishment 2017. If you go out there today, it's even more eroded because we just had that winter storm come through a few weeks back and it, it has eroded back into the dunes pretty substantially. So the reauthorization picture for Treasure Island and Long Key was very challenging. Uh, part of the reason why uh, we actually had to combine them into one project. They were separate federal authorizations, um, but because of the process that the Army Corps of Engineers goes through to evaluate projects and whether or not they should be federally authorized, you have to achieve a cost, a benefit to cost ratio of a minimum of one. It has to be greater than one. And we could not get there without those two projects being combined together. And you can see our BCR is, is still very low, 1.58. Uh, so what we're looking at here is, you know, there will be the as proposed, there would be a much more significant dune system out at Treasure Island and Long Key, um, with a with a wide berm in front. Um, if you're looking at that that little sketch there, you're seeing like an elevation of 10 feet. Um, if you go out to Passer Grill in an area where the dune is not is eroded, uh, that dune is at about 10 feet. So you'll be able to compare as to what, what a dune that high would look like um, at, at these locations. Um, I have the little caveat there at 2028 because um, that assumes that the project is completed in 2028. The 50 years extends forward from whatever date it is complete. So um, that's just a, a tentative until we actually have a construction date. 
The big picture here that I think we, we need to keep our eye on is the initial construction. You can see the cost split um, with, the, with the federal side paying almost 62%, but federal nourishments, our percentage goes up to 52.5%, and currently um, you know, we're paying around 20%. So the amount of funding that we're gonna have to kick in on Treasure Island and Long Key is gonna go up significantly. Um, On our website, we, we have um, information about the same key nourishment and we are, you know, day-to-day -day actively tracking the easement acquisitions. Um, I know many of you are very aware of, of what has occurred here. Um, for those who may not uh, have a, be as familiar, um, the Army Corps of Engineers has advised us that we need 100% of the easements within the limits of the same key project. Um, it is our largest project, and uh, the next cycle is scheduled for 2024. And they've advised us that if they don't have all of the easements in place, um, that this it's likely that this cycle will get skipped, which means this project would not move forward again until 2030. And if, uh, if you've been out there and you've seen some of these critically eroded areas, especially up there in Clearwater near Dan's Island, um, you know, Indian Rocks in some of these areas that have lost a lot of sand, especially with these winter storms coming through and some of our tropical events, 2030 is a long ways away. And, you know, it isn't just, you know, the, um, you know, it's the environment, it's, it's, it's the public infrastructure, it's the private infrastructure, um, you know, most people go out there and they value the beach for the beauty, for um, enjoying themselves, for seeing the nesting sea turtles and everything that a beach brings. Um, but a beach is also a tremendous piece of infrastructure and it protects um, everything behind it. We're way off that mark. You can see we're at about 48% and we, we need to get to 100% for the Corps to move forward. So. We are continuing dialogue with the core. Our federal delegation has been wonderful in trying to help us move the needle uh, with regard to the policy. Uh, we are still waiting uh, for an appointment of the Deputy Secretary of the Army so that we can continue these conversations. Um, but right now we're, we're kind of in limbo. Our funding picture, um, you know, right now we're, we're sitting with about 26.7 million in our coffers. And, and what this projection f looks forward, this is assuming that San Key goes forward. It's assuming that all of our projects go forward. It is assuming that when it says grants, it is assuming that we've, we've received 50% funding from DEP, which a lot of those are to be determined. Um, but you can see over there on the left, um, you know, for in the last, uh, you know, 18, 19, uh, how much funding we have received from the state. So we just, we, we do assume that we're gonna get our 50% request um, in our budgeting. If by chance um, the Army Corps does not move forward with uh, San Key, um, we would then be having conversations, is this something we take on ourselves? And um, it's, you saw the cost, it's, it's a really high price tag. Um, it would change this financial picture completely. And uh, you know, that is something that we as a community can do, um, but, but it, it has ramifications that, that this, this group and, and the Board of County Commissioners would have to, have to discuss. So that is um, all I have today. Um, I did want to point out the website there. Uh, we do have that, uh, that dashboard up that has um, information with regard to our erosion rates and where the beaches are individually sitting. So you can pick a beach and it'll tell you where it is with regard to erosion. It speaks to the easement issues um, as well as some other facts. So it's, it's a really great dashboard out there and it is live and it's updated um, on a daily basis as things change. Thank you, Kelly. Appreciate that uh, presentation. We do have a couple of questions. Let's start with Mayor Hibbard, and then Mike, and then. Thanks for being here, Kelly, and all that information. Uh, don't want to put you on the spot. Do we have a list of where the issues are for getting easements? And are you working with Clearwater staff? I'd be happy to help with that as well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think we're actually good in Clearwater. Um, I think we have all of our easements in Clearwater, I'm pretty sure. Um, 
Well, you just said Sand Key, you only have 50% and that's Clearwater. Yeah, Sand Key actually runs um, all the way from basically Sand Key, uh, Dan's Island, all the way down to the Reddingtons. Okay. Um, so yeah, in Beach World, Sand Key is much longer <laughs> than okay. uh, you know than most people think of it as. Um, and yet, but yes, to your point, if you um, go to the website here and click on the dashboard and you click on easements, you can look parcel by parcel, and the parcels that are green have have provided easements. The ones that are red have not. Secondly. Why don't we spend more money on tea groins and other things that preserve the renourished sand? Well, the you know the Army Corps and the state's policy is to really utilize the tools that are the least invasive. Um, you know that you know that really in the long term are. are you know, what they see is more cost effective, um, it's what the science shows. Uh, tea groins are, are challenging. Um, up them, the, the temporary groins that we had out there, the big banana tubes that people called them, the ones that kept getting vandalized, those were in place for almost 20 years. It took us over 20 years to get permits, to put the permanent ones in, because we had to prove beyond a doubt that there was gonna be no harm caused to the beaches south of there. Um, Any time, a structure is installed, um, it will erode usually the downdrift beach. I know you're very familiar with that. Um, you know, that's happened, you know, in the Madeira Treasure Island area. The management of the inlet and the um, jetties have starved the beaches to the south. So sunset is, is highly eroded because of that. And, and because of that, we have to take responsibility. So we are on the hook for nourishing Treasure Island because we, and the core essentially caused that to happen. So they're very, um, if, if we're going to consider any type of structures like that, we, we have a long process and there's a lot of work behind demonstrating that we're not gonna cause harm to somebody else. So the areas that sand is accreting, which I remember when I moved here in 1979, our house was not yet ready and we stayed at Mr. Kimball's hotel. And at that time there was a seawall and the beach was about 30 feet from that. What is it today? A quarter of a mile. <laughs> a quarter of a mile, and I own yeah. it. <laughs> Why don't we take some of the sand that accretes in certain areas and move it to places where it is diminishing, rather than going where we do currently and bringing it all the way up? Well, everything, when that erosion control line was set, a very, very long time ago. Um, anything, um, you know, uh, water word of that line is actually state land. It's, it's not um, the private property owners. Um, the other thing is because of all the structures that have been installed, the Army Corps has, we have borrow areas everywhere and they also manage those inlets. So we dred they dredge um, Blind Pass, they dredge Johns Pass, um, and they dredge all those borrow areas. Those are the sand sources they use first. Um, and then we, they don't go out to Egmont Shoal un until they've depleted all of those borrow areas first. But. Um, I think it would be very, very challenging to, to harvest sand, to be permitted to harvest sand off of, of an accreting beach to, um, to actually um, preserve one that's eroding. So the, the rules are very, very, um, so very challenging. So common sense is not yet broken out. Uh, there's a whole lot of common sense in this. Uh, you know, the easement, um, you know, our biggest challenge with the easement is that, um, in many areas where the Corps is asking for easements, there will be no work. Those easements are actually up in the dune. But the philosophy, the philosophy that they're, the policy that they're holding on to is that at some point in time in history, the federal government paid to put sand there and therefore, and we didn't have an easement when we should have, and therefore we have to provide it now, even though no work will be done there and there may be hundreds of feet between where they actually will be working and that, and that easement. So that's, that's part of our challenge with obtaining easements when, how do you explain to an individual living out there that has a, you know, 80 feet of dune in front of their property 
and beach renourishment occurs another you know, 50 feet beyond that, that they need to provide an easement all the way up in their dune. How do you convince them of that? It's, it's impossible. It's, isn't, that's, that's why we are where we are. So when you, yeah, common sense is uh, challenging in many areas here. Thank you. Yeah, and this is a real issue, real problem. So, Mike. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, my question really was on the heels of uh, Frank's comments about the T-groins, and I guess, you know, Kelly, um, uh, the beaches clearly are our most precious asset that we have here, especially for tourism. We're spending an incredible amount of money to renourish these beaches. Um, are there alternate steps that we can take, um, alternatives that we've seen used elsewhere, um, east coast, west coast, up and down uh, our various states, that is a more permanent fix. I mean, the, the yeah, I mean, the, every system, every coastal system has to be looked at uniquely. And, and our sand primarily moves, you know, north to south, all along shore transport. We do have a section that moves south to north, um, which is around Sankey Park, which is why it's so big. Um, but you know, somebody has asked, well, what if we just put structures in all the way, all the way just down? Well, the bottom line is we're still going to have to nourish because if you've seen what happens out at Huntley Moon or you see what happens out at um, Upham, you end up with those scalloped areas and erodes all around. You're still bringing back sand. So it, it'll never eliminate it. Um, but those structures in and of themselves create a lot of challenges because they, they can cause adverse impacts. Um, we cannot uh, restrict in any way um, wildlife and the ability of sea turtles to get to the beach. That's another challenge um, uh, with regard to structures is, isn't just um, the down drift effects that they might have, but also the effects that they might have on migrating wildlife. Um, so, I mean, those are the typical solutions that people bring in is, is like wave attenuation devices, um, T groins, jetties, and we do use them where, where it is appropriate, um, but there are challenges with using them in other areas. And I assume we've looked at uh, the most effective, the most um, beneficial um, steps that other communities have taken around the country to mitigate this. We have worked um, with the Army Corps to look at all available. They did do a study, let me step back a little bit. They did do a study um, many years ago. Uh, they had put in the, the, Redding, the structures in Reddington as a pilot. And uh, there were some significant issues with that structure. Um, I believe there, somebody died um, as a result of that structure. Um, it really didn't perform in such a way that the, the benefits outweighed the risks in their mind. So the other structures that were studied as part of that were not, they did not move forward with it because of that. Um, when the Long Key uh, Treasure Island re, um, reauthorization process moved forward, yep, they looked at all different types of approaches. Um, which is why we were a little shocked at the, the size of the dune. Um, but at the end of the day, that was the most cost-effective um, solution for those beaches. Um, but they did look at a, a wide variety of, of structures and other treatments that um, could possibly work. So, so from, your, from your chart, it looks like tens of millions of dollars will continue to be spent each year on renourishment. Yes. Um, at best, you know, we are at our current split um, on seeing key, which is around the 60-40, and then typically we get 20% from DEP. And again, that is all dependent on whether or not the state continues to fund nourishment. You know, they, I think last year was around 80 million. So obviously we're not going to get, I mean, if we need 15, or we're not getting that if it's 80 million for the entire state. Uh, so that, that would be very challenging if, if we have to fund a uh, uh, sand key going forward. Um, and also to the point that the, um, the reauthorization of Long Key and, um, and Treasure Island is going to cost us more in the future because the split is, is not as favorable to us. Kelly, one last question. What would happen if we did nothing? Would the beaches 
take their ebb and flow and some would get renourished naturally every year while others might be depleted, but would the cycle perpetuate itself? Um, those those accrete, uh, those beaches that accrete north north Clearwater Beach, um, Seeing Key, you know, I wouldn't expect anything really to change in those areas. Um, they're accre they're accreting beaches. We have a lot of sand in our system, you know, um, but no, the the rest of them would erode back to the seawall. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor Bajelski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for the presentation. Um, so essentially the county monitors all of this through your environmental department, I'm assuming, and, um, and then Visit St. Pete Clearwater contributes towards it. Is that how it works? Um, the, uh, our, our proportion of the cost is paid for by the bed tax, correct? Gotcha. Um, how do you feel about the contribution that you're getting? Do you need more? I mean, right now, I mean, the, the, con the, the half of a penny that is received now is, is covering, you know, our, our proportion of the federal projects. Um, I would have to say that if that changes and we have to foot seeing key and then also contribute a higher percentage on uh, Treasure Island and, and Long Key that we probably should come back here and have that conversation and re reassess those costs because I, uh, the county having to fund somewhere on the order of 40 plus million dollars every five to six years out of this fund um, would deplete those resources pretty quick. So we're in the process now of looking at our capital projects and what to do with all of that. So probably would be beneficial to keep us posted on all of that in case that needs to be a capital project, if you will, if this issue happens. Um, how do you determine um, what beaches get re-nourished? Are, are they all on some kind of cycle, every one of them in the, in the county or? Uh, the, the beaches that we um, oversee are all the Gulf fronting beaches. And yeah, they are on a, a pretty regular cycle with regard to our federal authorization. So St. Key is about on a, a six year. Again, if there's an emergency, we can request uh, an emergency uh, project. Um, our beaches are not eligible for FEMA re, you know, reimbursement. If, if we are hit, we have a, there's a different process that we go through because they are federally authorized projects. Um, you know, but it is on a six-year cycle, and then some of our other beaches are on a little bit more frequent. Treasure Island's a little more frequent because it's it erodes more quickly. And when you say Gulf fronting, so nothing on the intercoastal, is that what you're saying? Correct. We don't do any projects on the intercoastal. Why, why is that? Um, that has uh, always been, you know, the policy of... Um, of the program, I, as long as I've been here. Is, is, that, is that a county program or a, a federal? The, oh, you mean the, the authorizations? Yes, Army Corps right. will, only, um, will only participate in projects that, um, you know, have that, that public use, the, you know, recreation, the, um, uh, really, when you look at the title of these projects, they're not beach renourishment projects, they're um, mitigation projects. So they see them as a risk reduction. Um, from storms, and that's their primary purpose in doing it. So, obviously, I have to bring up the beach in my city, not Honeymoon, but then even Causeway, which I know you consider a road right away, but it, it's a beach, <laughs> and that's what people use it as. Um, and it has eroded considerably over the last, well, as long as it's existed. Yeah. Since yeah. the late 50s, early 60s. So. Yeah, I was just actually having um, uh, some dialogue um, with your uh, committee, your waterway committee there, and um, as well as the city staff. We uh, actually- I'm sure Jorge's been all over you. Oh, yes, <laughs> he has. Um, and uh, we applied for a grant um, through the Florida Department of Environmental Protection through their uh, mitigation program to take a deeper dive into the causeway and how we can um, improve the causeway so that it isn't, um, 
isn't so labor intensive, I'll be honest, right now we're spending about $180,000 a year just managing erosion on that causeway. Right. And it's, it's unsustainable to keep that up. Um, so we're very hopeful, given the tie of the causeway to Honeymoon Island Park, that the state will receive our grant application favorably. And that wouldn't be like a federal thing. It wouldn't be, it couldn't get into your program that would be, you know, looked at every six or 10 years or whatever the number should be. Yeah, I mean, what we have, um, the last time material was placed on the causeway was when we dredged the pass. And we do bathymetric surveys in the pass regularly to make sure it's not closing in or there's not any safety issues. And if we had to dredge that again, the causeway is a, a logical location because it's so close. Um, but yes, that, that, that causeway has not been funded by, by this funding source um, or part of a federal program. But it could be um, if you that, get other grants. Um, I'm not really sure because it's really kind of a maintenance function. Um, I mean, as far, I don't really. Uh, well, it's isn't not, it maintenance everywhere? Well, it's not. It's not considered a, a critically eroded beach by the state. In order to be eligible for state funding, it has to be in that. It has to be in their program, and it's it's not. Um, and the federal government uh, would not. I would not see a, a public purpose to it or a storm damage reduction purpose to it because uh, it's not it's not gulf fronting. Um, it's really, it is a road right away. It's more of a causeway. And I, I realize its uses are different than a, a lot of normal right of way. Um, but we are actively seeking funding to do something about it and to develop a plan because we all agree what we have right now is not sustainable. Thank you. Any other questions for Kelly? Yes, Doreen. Oh, yes, um, leading into that Causeway, Dunedin Pass conversation, thank you, Kelly, for the presentation. Um, looking at John's Pass, I know that there's been discussions between the county, and I've not personally been involved in those conversations, but it has become a rather critical, and I'm, I'm looking at Phil, who operates out of John's Pass, and he would probably know more than I do, but. Um, where's that headed? I mean, it, it's, it's critically filling in. It's sand that could be repurposed potentially and used for, for example, Treasure Island and Long Key. Is there, are you familiar with those discussions and where is it headed? Yes, we uh, partnered with the city, the Florida uh, DOT because they have road right away that goes over the pass and uh, the private property owner out there to conduct a study earlier this year um, to kind of look at what's going on out there and what potential solutions are. Uh, the number one ranked alternative out of that study, um, we we did some preliminary engine, very, I don't say preliminary engineering costs, we'll say cost estimates based on recent projects, um, that one that we're looking at down in, in Grand Canal, south of there, we had some, some recent engineering numbers that we could apply to that project. Um, we, we have shared um, that information um, with the city and uh, I believe uh, Representative Cheney is, is submitting a appropriation request to help fund that, that project. Um, the, that sand, um, we did talk with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection um, to see uh, if one, potentially uh, Madeira Beach did sustain damage during Tropical Storm Ada. And um, while not part of a federal project and does not normally receive nourishment uh, because it, it is not an eroding beach, um, because of the storm damage, could we use that sand there if it was qualifying, meaning it met the criteria, the type of sand, the color? Um, and and the, the state said that they, they would consider um, such a request under a one-time project um, to kind of repair. They are doing uh, re restoration work on their structures out there. So as, as part of that, they would Coins. consider it. In lieu of that, it, it could go south to Sunset because that's the eroded beach and that would be consistent with the Johns Pass Inlet Management Plan. And I believe they've done that before. I mean, when they've dredged to open that up and taken the sand and used it elsewhere, which seemed, instead of having to go, as you say, out to the Egmont, it, it seemed like a much more cost effective. We have a borrow area, right? I mean, we, the, Ar the Army Corps has a borrow area um, out off the mouth of Johns Pass and they dredge it every cycle. 
Um, the, pan the main channel itself that goes right down the center is very deep and it's self-scouring. It hasn't been dredged since the 80s and it doesn't, that main channel doesn't need, to need it. It's just on the north side where they're having some challenges. Okay, and um, the other question about the required easements that's been ongoing for the Sand Key project uh, is, are those same requirements by the Army Corps going to be in place for these other areas of renourishment, like back to Upham and, you know, Treasure Island, are they suddenly going to be faced with these same easement requirements by all property owners? All the easement requirements are the same, but we have pretty much secured everything we need to do those projects. Um, there are a couple out there that we don't have, but they're not, um, you know, we basically skip them and start after after where we don't have them. So it, it doesn't impact the entirety of the project. We just have a new starting point. Thank you. On those easements, Kelly, are the, is that a new policy by the Army Corps that they're implementing now as far as asking for easements when they're not actually applying things to it? Or is this just trying to correct an, a mistake that they made years ago? What I mean... You're correct, it's the latter. Okay. Um, in 1986, Congress passed the, the Water Resources Development Act, WERDA, and there's some language in there about not utilizing federal funds on private shores. Um, it, isn't, it doesn't go much deeper than that, and um, in, I think it was somewhere in the late 90s um, that the Army Corps provided implementation guidelines on that um, to, their, to their staff. Um, I think there was some misinterpretation as to how that was to go forward, and it didn't actually come to bear until Sandy, when um, the New Jersey beaches, uh, you remember seeing the pictures of basically houses falling off, I mean, looking like it's falling off a cliff, um, and the Army Corps went out there to rebuild those beaches, and um, they were like, time out. We don't have rights out here. And so that caused the Army Corps to basically look at every project they do and and we got caught up in that. And that's been semi-recent, I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah very recent. Yeah. It actually was going on like right in the middle of the Sand Key project that we were doing in 2018. I mean, we were negotiating segments on the fly. Uh, you may remember being out there and yep. kind of literally yep. as the project was moving down the line when people realized they were going to get skipped, they were signing easements and the Army Corps was very, the staff were very wonderful to work with and the contractor was wonderful to work with just to add those segments as we went. Um, but we, we were not able to do that entire project in 2018 because of those gaps. Yeah. And you, you mentioned how difficult it is for to explain to people why they're being asked for that. So. Anyway, uh, Russ Kimball. For somebody that doesn't need any, because I'm very fortunate where our location is uh, next to the pass, I just want to say thank you. I've sat in this con uh, presentation a few times, and I want to thank you and your department on how you're on top of everything. And, and when we hear about the numbers actually have been contributed or we've received from the federal government because of, of our county administration of uh, of it and then I'm proud of the four million dollars a year that we give that builds up to match it and I know that we get a fair amount of the state funds that are coming into Florida but I just want to say thank you thank you very much uh, Phil <clears throat> the follow-up on the John's pass issue that uh, Doreen had brought up um, it's my understanding that well, let's talk about <clears throat> the responsibility of taking care of problems that are created by trying to solve other problems. Like you said, the tea grinds can cause other issues and you feel obligated to, to then take care of whatever issue that was. Um, the Deer Beach is a, a creating beach, you say it's, it's accumulating. And where does it get that sand from? <laughs> where does Sand Key get its sand from? It gets it from the renourishment projects that then move north or south, correct? There is some, but I mean, with regard to um, you know, you know, the the, the beach to the north, um, Sand Key Park is is really outside of the the beach renourishment area. Um, when I say we're we're very sand rich, we are incredibly sand rich, and I I um, 
it's very hard to explain um, when people are looking at a, a very small area. For example, we're dealing um, with some sand accretion issues in um, Terra Verde. And we look at the system very locally and say, well, it's, it's going from here to here. But if you don't look to the west of that and you don't look beyond the fact that there's so much sand out there. The Tampa Bay Ebb Shoal is huge, and it brings so much sand to our system. And let me tell you, I, as for as some of the problems that it causes, it actually is hugely beneficial when you look at areas like Miami-Dade, where they're having to truck sand in because they don't have that rich sand source off their shores. So it is a, a combination of things. Yes, we're going out there getting sand. <laughs> we're bringing it in. It erodes away. We go back out there and we get it again. It ends up in the borrow areas that the Army Corps harvests. But to be able to specifically point and say, well, this sand's coming from here to there is incredibly challenging because we have such a sand-rich environment. But um, Dr. Wang with the University of South Florida has spent a lot of time studying John's Pass. He did the inlet management plan. Um, he did some additional studies in the area. He just did this re most recent John's Pass study, and he said really that inlet is not behaving any differently than other inlets across the state in that sand is going to accrete on that side due to the tidal current. So it's, it's really not, yes, we've manipulated the system through engineering improvements. Yes, we dredged a, you know, a, the Army Corps dredged a, a channel through there that didn't exist. Yes, a, a bridge was put in that didn't exist naturally. Um, yes, a jetty was installed. But really, um, with regard to how the sand is is um, depositing, it's it's really not different from that different from unmanipulated inlets. Um, it's my understanding that the, when they built the new bridge, they had a lot of scaffolding, a lot of structure that they had banded there uh, when the bridge, it was still there. And that's what's created the problem. There's structure that was left there, and that is where the sand is accumulating. It's, it's eddying around that structure. That's completely buried, and I guess it's beyond the statute of limitations to deal with it. But that's my understanding. Is that correct? There was abandoned structure there, and that's created a, a place for the sand to accumulate around. There is, there is um, you know, hard material down there, both riprap and um, some, some bridge, bridge, legacy bridge material. Um, you know, it, but to say, uh, I just want to say very clearly that DOT is a partner in this, and they are willing to remove that material as part of a project to oh. help. Um, facilitate the water flow because Dr. Wang's study did identify that um, that that material is basically slowing the flow of water down. And if we, um, you know, remove some of that material um, and we dredge down uh, a certain depth, that the water flow through there will help maintain a, right. a more clear condition. It'll take so, care of itself. It's just like the tea growing. You know, anything you stick yeah. out. And it accumulates around it, and that's exactly what, what happened there. They left that there, and the sand comes in past the jetty, it comes in, and it gets trapped there. It, it, it naturally does that because that structure is there. And I do, like Mr. Kimball said, I appreciate you all that, that's being right. done. Don't get me wrong on this. It just seems like that was caused by a specific act um, building that bridge, and they shouldn't have left it there, and that's caused. It wasn't a natural thing. It's it's natural because the structure's there and it will naturally accumulate now. So I don't think it's going to get much worse than it is, but it's still, it's, it is a problem. And well, I'm, the, glad being, I'm glad it's being looked at. Yeah, the, the alternative um, that was recommended uh, was to dredge out kind of a settling basin to the west of the bridge to remove the sand that is accumulated between the first structure and the seawall, including the rip, some of the riprap and some of the legacy bridge material and then remove that material in front of Hubbard's um, deeper than has been done in the past, um, such that you know, as sand comes in, it would, it would settle in that settling basin instead of moving all the way into the system. So right. it should provide a longer lasting solution. Is there some kind of timeline on that? Um, really, it's, um, I, like I said, the uh, Rep Cheney is um, working on a, on a an appropriation request, so we'll see um, see where that goes. Um, otherwise, we'll have to. I mean, if there's um, if there's no state funding, we'll have to revisit how to um, fund that project. But the Department of Transportation is committed to being part of the part of the um, a partner in this. Um, the private property owner has 
has indicated that he's he's on board so long as we have a longer term solution. Right. So we'll continue to move move this forward. Great. Glad to hear it. Thank you. Kelly, thank you. Um, yeah, I think you did okay pinch hitting. <laughs> yeah, you, you really know what's going on, at least in the, all, the, all the projects that we're talking about. We just really wanted to get, apparently we needed this conversation, um, whether it's project specifics that people are talking about or just kind of what our role is. And I think um, Mayor Bujowski raised that one issue about our capital side and what we do with our funding there. And, and this may be a part that we're going to have to address going forward. But um, thank you for being here. Um, and thank you for shedding a lot of light on, on some of these really complicated issues. Yeah. Well, um, thank you for, for inviting us here. And we're available anytime. OK. Thank you, Kelly. And uh, now, Steve, you have five minutes to finish the rest of the agenda. So um, go for it. Uh, good luck. <laughs> Pressure, pressure, pressure. Well, and then I guess I'll put that pressure then on our, our next presentation. Um, and on uh, this one, wanted to just get a quick update and notice the word quick um, from Visit Florida. We actually have a new uh, regional uh, representative for Visit Florida as Jen Carlisle moved on to Madden Media. And uh, so I'd like to introduce Sam with Visit Florida. I think he's been on the job about four weeks, maybe a little bit longer, but he's not a stranger to this area. So uh, Sam, would, can't wait to hear about your quick presentation. Wonderful. <laughs> Hi, Sam. Welcome. Hey, good morning. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, my name is Sam Rubenzer. I'm the new uh, regional partnership manager for the Central West region of Visit Florida. And as Steve mentioned, uh, very recent uh, addition. I actually just joined a little over a month ago, but uh, I've been lucky enough to have lived here in the Tampa Bay area for uh, a little over 23 years. Uh, I spent a couple of years uh, over at Visit Tampa Bay in Hillsborough, and before that, uh, several years over here on this side of the bridge with Ruth Eckerd Hall. So uh, today I'm going to provide an overview uh, of the recent work that Visit Florida has done on behalf of our state and where tourism stands in its recovery. So as many of you know, Visit Florida is Florida's official tourism marketing corporation, serving as a public-private partnership that matches state appropriation with private investment dollar for dollar. Simply put, Visit Florida promotes tourism and markets our state around the US and the world. Our job is to make sure that our state's tourism industry remains strong and continues to support Florida jobs and our robust economy. Our partners in Florida's economy depend on the visitors Visit Florida attracts and the revenue they provide. As we continue recovering from the fallout of COVID-19, our mission has never been more important than it is today. Uh, after capping off 10 years consecutive visitation in 2019, we saw these numbers dramatically decline by nearly 40% in 2020, with international visitation down well over 90% at the height of the pandemic. During the pandemic, Florida remained open while most other states were closed. In fact, Florida was the only state doing any advertising outside its borders for roughly seven months. This period where we effectively alone in marketing created a very strong strategic position versus other states, and we are now ready to capitalize on that. Through our aggressive and well-timed marketing during the pandemic, Florida tops the list of desired destinations among American travelers, beating out competitors like New York, Las Vegas, Hawaii, and California. To quote Caroline Batetta, the president and CEO of Visit California, Florida is eating our lunch. Hmm. Now we'll talk a little bit about some of the marketing that we did uh, to increase visitation. At the onset of the pandemic of March of last year, Visit Florida began working on a comprehensive plan to bring visitors back to the state. First, in August 2020, we launched an in-state campaign that called on Floridians to take a vacation in their home state, marking the first time that we've marketed within our own borders. Then in October 2020, we launched our domestic campaign that expanded our marketing to key drive markets within 700 miles of Florida. And uh, the results were really amazing, 632 million total impressions. And then uh, Expedia, $134 to $1 average return on ad spend, 62.5 million in gross bookings, 1.14 million room nights. Here are some examples of the advertising from our in-state and domestic campaigns. Uh, on the slide, you'll see this is an Instagram story 
uh, showing a restaurant in Miami. This is a travel banner uh, highlighting Willingston, Florida. This is a digital billboard for Apopka. And finally, we have a digital banner promoting deals for Universal Orlando Resort. In December 2020, we launched our Winter Sun Seekers campaign uh, in our traditional Eastern and Midwestern markets. In addition, for the first time, we expanded our marketing to the Western US, uh, Washington, Oregon, and California. In March of this year, we followed with our Massive Families campaign, which further honed in on Florida's popularity as the number one destination for family travelers. This ad aired on over 250 cable networks in all US states except Alaska and Hawaii. So here is a look at one of the key advertisements from our family campaign. Pete, do I need to click to uh, get this to play? It's time to let yourself explore the wide open beauty of Florida. Cast away your stress and soak up some peace of mind. Say yes to something new, like this, or this, or what's this? Enjoy a little freedom, a touch of spontaneity, and lots and lots of sunshine. Make each day shine exactly the way it's supposed to. Whatever getaway you're imagining, you can make it real here. Because in Florida, it's possible. So our, our business partners are the heart of everything we do at Visit Florida. Among our most value par valued partners is your local community. I'm pleased to report that all of Florida's destination marketing organizations, or DMOs, are now Visit Florida partners. Several months ago, Visit Florida was awarded $5 million in CARES Act grant funding by the Economic Development Administration, or EDA, to help support our uh, recovery of Florida's tourism economy. 100% of this funding is being used to assist our DMO partners throughout the state with Visit Florida's largest cooperative advertising effort ever. The ads aim to inspire and ultimately remind us all that in the Sunshine State, our typical day is anything but typical. The in-state portion focuses on state pride with 28 participating partners, including 12 RAO counties. The national portion continues the momentum of the power vacation messaging with 19 participating partners. And this will be running November 29th, 2021 through April 3rd, 2022. So the next video will help show um, all the great things we have in store for this program. Typical day in Florida. We'll be over here while the rest of the world wishes they were. Here we can stumble into the amazing, wander into delight. We can turn any day into the perfect getaway. And the best part, it's all right here, right in our own backyard.
So I've given a top level overview of the marketing that we've been doing, and now I'd like to briefly talk about how it's impacting visitation. With our most recent uh, visitation estimates, I'm happy to report that Florida is well on its way to a full recovery. Between April and June of this year, Florida welcomed 31.7 million total visitors, an increase of over 220% from 2020, with domestic visitation actually 6% higher than in 2019 and before COVID. Visit Florida's goal is to beat The Economist's projections of recovery by 2024, and we, we believe we're on track to do just that. Though international travel restrictions have kept our strategy focused primarily on domestic audiences, Visit Florida has been working nonstop to put Florida in the best possible position for re-entering the global market. International visitors are vital to Florida tourism and typically stay longer and spend twice as much per person as domestic visitors. While international travel was halted, Visit Florida developed over 100 international virtual events to keep Florida top of mind in the UK, Ireland, Germany, Canada, Brazil, Mexico, and Colombia. With international borders now open, we are very bullish on Florida's strategic position internationally. So in conclusion, uh, thanks for the opportunity to provide uh, an update on all the great work that Visit Florida has been doing on behalf of our state. Um, my email uh, information, contact information is up there. Um, with me being as new as I am, um, probably could answer uh, questions a little bit more accurately <laughs> by, via email as I can kind of look into it a little bit more. But I also wanted to uh, ask Steve if he wanted to add anything about some of the specific programs that we've been doing with, uh, with Visit St. Pete Clearwater. Thank you, Sam, for the presentation and being for us today. I just want to mention a couple of things. Uh, one, I think you guys are aware of as a body, Life's Rewards, the eight-episode uh, TV series that was on Amazon was a co-op through Visit Florida. So great on that. The second thing is, and I know we had it uh, in our presentation on November 4th, and I think we've talked about it here when we looked at the, our plan moving forward, uh, we are part of a million dollar advertising campaign of which our contribution was 200,000 and Visit Florida is at 800,000. And it's dedicated just to St. Pete Clearwater. So that will be running uh, the early part of, uh, of winter. And then the, the third thing I just wanted to mention, between sales, direct sales, PR, and then advertising, the number of co-ops that we're doing because of Visit Florida, I think is, is critical. Allow, again, allows us to go through and extend our, our dollar. Um, so again, thank you for your presentation and, and quick update. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah Mike, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Sam, thanks for the presentation. Congratulations on your new appointment. Thank you very much. Is your presentation available for us to, to see on your website, or is there a way we can get a copy of that? Let me look into that. This was a, a presentation I know that um, had been given. I think Dana had, had given it at some point, and I kind of took it and tweaked it and edited it a little bit for this, you know, for here today. So I just have to kind of look into that a little bit and see what That'd I can That'd be great. Do. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions uh, for Sam? Again, thank you for being here and congrats on the on the appointment. And we look Great. forward to working closely with you. Same here. Thank you all very much. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, great. Thank you, Liz. All right. Uh, next on the updates, I just want to give a finance report. So in your packet. Um, you received our financial statement. This is for September of 21, so this will have been the end of the, fis uh, the fiscal year. Uh, go over uh, three areas. One is uh, pers uh, personnel services. Second is the, you know, the operating, and third is in, in direct sales. Bottom line is um, we, we took in more money than we spent. So that was all great news. Uh, again, keep in mind last year, um, the year started off slow. You know, October, November, actually October through mid or February, we were still what I'll call recovering. And then March hit and then everything opened up and then um, the industry o opened up as well. When it comes to uh, personnel, we had um, a couple, you know, again, we had a savings there due to um, unfilled uh, positions. 
um, that have happened through the year. Uh, currently, we are filling three positions, two in sports, one in um, activations. And then uh, we have three, um, uh, uh, yeah, four other positions that uh, have not, were not filled for the year, but we will be filling this coming, this coming fiscal year. Under um, the total for um, operating, we again were under budget there. Uh, primarily, the reasons there, again, was a, uh, a ramp up time period, uh, uh, especially related to travel, related to training and education, as well as um, uh, shipping, postage, communications. Again, as we st the first five months were slow, and then everything started picking up to where I will call as we finish the year. What, what I would call normal, although for me, normal here was the first 90 days. I don't know if that was, that was really normal, but then, uh, so we're, we're getting back, we're getting back uh, to that. And then under promotions uh, expense, uh, we were, we finished a year under, under budget there. Primarily uh, in advertising marketing, we were over, but that was because of our million dollar commitment for uh, Super Bowl and then under elite events, we were below our target because there were some events that um, had canceled that were the early part of the fiscal year, not the latter part of the, fisc the fiscal year. Um, or again, it was ramp up in terms of programs and the, things, and the things that we were doing. So bottom line is at the end of the year to our budget of, of, of 37 uh, million, uh, we were at 32 million, um, and so that's how we finished the year. Any questions? Yes, Phil. Since we were talking about beach nourishment, um, <clears throat> the budget was 4.3 million, and we funded it by 4.3 million, but that was the budget. Our actual one half of 1% would have been 6.1 million. Um, so we only fund what was budgeted, regardless of how we collect. Um, I believe the answer is yes to that. I, I thought I saw Jim earlier. If he could, conf I don't know if he was still here. He might have stepped out. But it's it's like our budget. You know, we're at 37 million, even though we ended up collecting almost 73 million. We're still at at that number. So um, I don't know if Jim can pull up the number r real quick. But I, th I think Phil, we go with the budgeted number versus what was actually collected. And what happens to the, the rest goes into the capital balance? Jim's not here. Oh, he is. <laughs> Sorry, I had to step out. Um, can you repeat the question? I was, uh, we budgeted for $4.3 million for beach nourishment, and our collections were much higher, and one half of 1% would have been $6.1 million. And the question was, would we, would we go ahead and back fund that to beach nourishment, or would we just be part of the capital reserve? We have not. It it just comes goes into the capital reserves, um, and it, uh, because in previous years when we were short, we didn't cut back. We did in twenty because there was a drastic drop in the the revenue. Uh, but what we budgeted in FY twenty one is what we transferred, um, and that was you know it was at a much lower amount than what we collected, uh, and you know it could be addressed in future budgets if. if uh, the TDC, I mean, the TDC and the BCC desires, but it would take a, a budget amendment to make those changes, and uh, unless we do it in a future uh, budget. So we're going to, for future budgets, we're going to budget so much, and if we fall short, we're going to still fund that amount? Well, historically, we yeah. have it, except FY20, because there was such a drastic drop, uh, right. and we were concerned about uh, available cash flow, so we cut that back to what uh, the, under the new normal projection. Under, let's say normal pre-pandemic, yeah. then that, that would be the way we go. We would fund whatever's budgeted, regardless of whether we made that number or not. Yes, that, that's that's what we had okay. done in the past. And Just curious how it worked. Yeah, yes. and the for the for the current current year, I believe it's 5.6 million is what we have budgeted for beach uh, transfers to the to the capital fund. Um, and you know, it, each year it's a, a budgeting decision that. 
as recommended by the, the TDC and the adopted by the BCC. Staff obviously is critically aware of these funding uh, options that we have, or we're trying to continue to get federal funding, state funding, and that kind of thing, and tuned into what we have in the, in the budget. And so whatever we're, I mean, I think we don't want to jump out ahead of ourselves, you know, in terms of spending if we don't have to. So right. I think putting it into the reserves yeah. accom accomplishes what we wanted it to do that year, and yet put some away for a rainy day, or if we get shortfalls, I think we're gonna yeah, have and, to. And I don't know what the, um, you know, if we send it over to the capital fund, I don't know how easy it would be to get it back if we needed it, but we could always do a one-year uh, bump up if if we desired to go above the half percent or half of the third percent. We could, yeah. uh, you know, that's that's a budget decision. Yeah. That's made each year. Yeah. And as Kelly said, there's a uh, little over $26 million in, in the um, capital fund fund balance in FY22 for future beach projects or our, for our portion. Phil, did you get your question answered? Yeah, okay. I just was curious the process yeah. of it. Okay. Is it earmarked for beach nourishment at some point or if we just go back into capital fund yeah. reserve? Any other questions on the financials? Okay, Steve, go ahead. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And on strategic plan, let's see if they pull up. There we go. All right, on strategic plan, just to give you a quick update of where we're at, if you attended the November 4th meeting um, and the, well, actually November 4th, both meetings, the morning and the afternoon, we did give an update there, but we've, we've had a couple of, of changes in terms of where we are in fulfillment or where we are in, in the process. Right now, under the telephonic interviews, we're at 75% complete of uh, the stakeholder interviews. We're at 80% on the uh, online stakeholder surveys. We're at 85% on the uh, community sentiment survey. And then right now, they're in the 50% through in, in, uh, industry and visitor uh, analysis. What's left to go through, uh, just from a timetable standpoint, uh, we have stakeholder workshops that will occur in January. It's probably going to be the very first week of January, so right after we come back from the holiday break. Um, and we're looking at three days, and I think three different workshops. Again, more public input on um, strategically where do, where do we need to be going. Um, the Also, the, and then through February is the actual putting together of the plan based on all the, the surveys as well as the workshop. And then looking at February, March for presentation, not only to this body, uh, but to the BCC as well as to the in industry as a whole. So it's moving along well. Um, I did, you know, uh, I was hoping to have HCP here today to kind of give some high level look at what we're seeing with the, the strategic plan because there is some good things coming out of it. Uh, they were unable to, to be here, so I'll have them in December just to give like, you know, the high level look of what they're hearing. This isn't this isn't meant to be the final information, but just to give you an idea of the conversations. They're, they're pleased with the direction that we're going and the information that they're getting from, from everybody. So I, I'm excited um, about the next steps and where, where we end up going from there. Uh, any questions on strategic plan? All right, destination metrics. I am not going to go through, it, well, I'll, I'll hit the highlights, um, but I'm not going to, you know, talk, I'll, I'll keep my mouth shut as much as possible. Um, so on the TDT collections, uh, this is again for the fiscal year. Black line represents 21. The dotted line represents 20. The gray over to the right of each of the, the, the bars, that represents 2019. So let's assume 2019 is the gold standard. Uh, you can certainly see where we started the fiscal year, as, as I've been highlighting throughout the year, and then where we ended up uh, finishing. Uh, we right at, at 70, um, the 70, 72.5 million as compared to the 62.5 million in 2019. So a $10 million difference. 
What we saw that come out of is because of not only the rate that was being charged through lodging, whether that was through hotels or vacation rentals, but occupancy. It's a combination of both of those things that helped drive that. We, we, we had some properties that were out of commission. In other words, they were going through renovation so that they wouldn't have been collecting the TDT. We had other properties that opened, so it was new. So again, when you really look at the overall scheme of things, it was really rate and occupancy combined that helped drive that large increase. Uh, again, looking at um, the occupancy, you can see what we have here for um, the month of September for both not only 21, but also for 20 and for 2019. And, and again, you, in this case, you can see uh, wh where we compare both not only occupancy, but ADR, both for hotel, motel, as well as vacation rental. And then at the bottom, we look at whether you were beach or whether you were, were inland. What I found interesting on the bottom slide, when you look at occupancy, there was, there was they were very, they started to be very close um, when I originally looked at it, but then you look at the fact that, uh, that um, the, the beach was up over inland and also as well as the, as the ADR. And when I first started looking at it, it was almost even, which was kind of surprising, but um, it, it went through and, and changed. So again, you know, occupancy being up and again, looking at com uh, compared to 19 with the exception of beach inland because we only can compare it to 20. Uh, graphically, this kind of shows the same information. Black line is where we are for 21. Uh, you do see a bump up. That's first for the first three weeks, I believe, in October. So again, I think that's going to be up over where we were in, in 19. And then looking at vacation rentals, uh, the information we have on those that report to us, again, solidly ahead of where we were in, uh, um, in 2020. And then finally, looking at the visitor profile, uh, looking at 21 versus 19, uh, the items in red, there were significantly diff there was a significant difference. So if you look at the uh, time between uh, decision um, to arrival day, it, again, in 19 was at 75 days, it's at 57, so again, very short. However, if I remember correctly from last month, that 50 for, the, for 21, that um, number was actually for 47. So it is bumping up a little bit. So that's encouraging, but I still think uh, consumers out there are still, in some cases, waiting to the last minute versus the um, advanced planning. The other is the percent that stayed overnight, a difference between 19 and 21. And then the other uh, significant difference was household income, um, 100 grand in 19, 112,000 in, in 21. And again, from the, the visitor, uh, 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 again, I just took a snapshot of some of the, what I call key areas to look at from the visitor's uh, standpoint. Um, and again, if you've got questions on this, please let me know. I did want to address, I know in the report that you get, it does list out um, you know, how many surveys were conducted. It's for that month only. Um, it doesn't, doesn't show the other months. However, we will change that for future months so that you can look at basically uh, how many surveys are being done, but they're all pretty much the same in terms of number, but it does fluctuate a, a little bit. Commissioner Bujowski, or Mayor Bujowski, sorry. Just real quick, um, so this will be the, this September is the last one for 2021, right? We'll get the annual report sometime soon? Actually, uh, next month I'll have the third quarter, and then I think the month after that we will have the, um, the re really ends up being, I think, the calendar year. Um, oh. So, but the third quarter, I mean, I had some highlights because we actually got the report um, but I haven't yeah, yeah. Uh, refined through it to see where we're at. Okay, so it's going to be calendar year, not fiscal. Yeah, I think I think we can do both. So, but if we're now just now getting third quarter, which is the end of September, then the fourth quarter we would get in Jan I think in January, uh, if not okay. February. Okay. Thank you. 
And the only other thing I wanted to mention, and this is just real quickly, also next month, uh, and I'll have uh, Jeffrey here, is there's a new tool that uh, we have that shows a, some other key data. Um, and, and, and I think one of the key things is like, for instance, where people are visiting from and whether it's a short trip, long trip, overnight trip, and then where those top markets are, all using great cell phone data. So uh, we love keeping track of where our visitors are or, or aren't, but that we'll, we'll have that, so. Anything else before we? Yeah, that's it. Well, that's, that wasn't too bad. Twenty-five extra minutes, but I tell you what. Let's uh, let's take a five-minute break. We'll start back at uh, ten thirty, and then we'll go for an hour um, on the elite funding. Okay, so we can get out of here as scheduled. Um, a little less discussion probably than we want, but at least we'll get some of that. In, okay, in five minutes. Thanks.
question about some of the things that are on our minds, but uh, we, at least we had the start of a conversation and maybe more of those will happen in the first quarter of next year. Um, so let's go ahead and get started back. Um, Steve, um, I guess this is uh, elite funding. We do have a time for public comments. Um, I'm assuming in no public comments this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, and let's get started, Steve. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and really for this hour, I, I wanna use this as an idea gathering session. I wanna have it be more of a discussion. It, interesting enough, when we, when we briefly have talked about elite events, I took it very clearly that the, uh, the answer of doing nothing is not the answer. Um, and so making any minor changes or edits as needed, not the option. We need to really look at uh, some, a couple of things. So what I wanna do today is talk about um, some really four key areas in the guideline process. Uh, one is the definitions, the funding categories, the application review, and then the funding guidelines. And really what I'd like at the end of our hour discussion is enough guidance from you guys where we can then go back to the, to the uh, guidelines itself, make rec recommended changes, and then um, bring back some tweaks at December, but bring back the final document in January. So again, it's, you know, I've had a couple of conversations with the TDC members. I know, I mean, I, I, I keep saying I'm the new guy because I feel like I lost a year, but it's, you know, being able to go through this process, and now I think we can really start looking at some changes that really make the, the program uh, better. Um, everyone has a copy of the guidelines, and then I also put a, a document on your paper, on your desk called the, the uh, elite event grant program discussion areas. And this is really just to start stimulating the, the conversation. Um, the first thing I wanted to look at was definitions. And we certainly ran into um, some uh, creative ideas when it came through this year's elite discussions over what is, as an example, what is cultural and heritage? Uh, because there's an actual definition in here which I, I don't think anyone disagrees with. However, does it need to be further refined? At the end of the day, I, you know, I wanna enhance this process um, so that we can better, um, uh, you know, our role being tourism development is how can we create more of that, which then in the end helps our communities as well as the destination um, as a whole. So I don't know if we just want to start in under uh, cultural heritage and just give me your your thoughts on that. And I know, good, I got to see we have two hands. Yes, Mayor, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, <clears throat> well, my first suggestion would be that we, we don't define it as cultural heritage. Um, I mean, I think what we're really talking about are events that have a community impact. Uh, and we may want to just look at it from that standpoint of, um, you know, and that impact could take different forms, but if it's an event that has a community impact um, and, it, and, and some, of, uh, some of this could still stay as a definition, um, but, but I think when we start talking about cultural heritage, um, it, 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 it's confusing to begin with uh, and I think there's a lot of different ways you can define what's truly cultural versus what really impacts our communities, each of our individual communities. There, we all have events in our communities that have a tremendous impact that might not fit squarely under the definition of cultural heritage. Okay. Um, Mayor Kuchowski. Well, I don't disagree with what um, Mayor Cressman said but I know that, you know, I think having a category, because I think what we're seeing coming out of the cultural heritage category are events that, um, that do impact communities or uh, I, I guess the way to describe it is events that, that add to um, Pinellas County on a whole 
maybe there are things that happen annually that don't attract as many room nights that would fall under the other guidelines. Um, but you couldn't imagine the county not having those events. So I think it, it depends on how the whole uh, board here feels about having those events itself being covered um, by some measure, some amount of money. And I'm not saying a lot of money, but you know, something that we want to keep going. Um, for instance, I'll just use my own city as an example. I could not imagine the city of Dunedin without having its Mardi Gras festival or its Wines the Blues festival. We attract 30,000 people into our downtown for those events. And they've grown over the last 25 years to be huge things. I mean, I have elected officials come up for those things from all over the county because they're widely supported events, but they don't necessarily always attract new room nights. They do attract day trippers. So I think the conversation really has to kind of talk about that. And and is, you know, is attracting a day tripper, is is supporting sort of the vibe of Pinellas County. You know, if Pinellas County what didn't have a cool vibe, which I think is supported by a number of events in our county, um, would people come here just for the beach and no, nothing else? It's not always a building that is that is creating the vibe. So I think that's the conversation we have to have. Yeah, Mike. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mayor, I couldn't agree more with you. I think too often we get caught up measuring room nights as the as the uh, the stick that we should use to gauge all of these these programs. Um, really, we we can look at culture, but we can also look at um, dollars committed and dollars expended within the county. Um, whether it's at a hotel, whether it's at a restaurant, whether it's at a shop, um, is somewhat immaterial as long as they're spending money in the county. And, and uh, we should not be jaded just by the room night measure. Uh, Chuck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I go back to the presentation that was made maybe four months ago when it was a person that did not get funded um, for their event. And when you listen to the event, it was fantastic. It was a run. It was in St. Petersburg. Um, and they gave back to the community. They, they donated. They, they seemed to have checked every box, but yet somehow they didn't fit our definition. So I would like to see that case, for instance, if staff, Steve, could look at why didn't that race get funded with all of the things that that man said that he was doing for the community sounded fantastic. We should have. So there's something missing. So I would like to see what what they missed. The second thing is one of the biggest events we have is our Grand Prix once again in St. Petersburg. But it but it's it's huge. It's beautiful. Brings in so many people. When I first joined the TDC, and someone came and, and sat down and spoke with me about about their event that they were soliciting my, you know, hoping I would vote for theirs and. Um, so I listened to their pitch, but, and I can't even remember what, what that event was, but the point was they went and talked about the Grand Prix, and I hope Mayor Kreisman can, can fill us in with more detail. But you'll notice we don't fund the Grand Prix anymore, and it's such a huge event. And it was explained to me that the folks at the Grand Prix were so, that they wouldn't, it was too complicated to go through it. And how can an event like the, the Grand Prix n not want our money? Um, so. Uh, I, I'd love to see if, if Mayor has any, any reason, uh, ideas why and their thought process. Okay. Uh, I just want to continue going around here just a minute and I'll get back to you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor Hibbert? Yeah, I think calling it uh, cultural heritage, I agree with Rick. I think it's really quality of life. I think it needs to be a separate category. And the only thing I'm concerned about is, and we all have numerous events that would fall under these categories is the problem is there's almost an endless stream of events and at some point you have to say this is the budget for that category mm -hmm. and they all have qualities that are beneficial for residents and it may spill over to some tourism uh, but kind of like our capital projects it helps both 
And I just think we need to solidify how much we're going to allocate towards these community events, I would call them more or less, that are wonderful, but we do have finite resources. Yeah. And I can give you a list that goes on and on in mm -hmm. Clearwater. If I don't think any of us want to get parochial about it. We just want to make sure that we're participating at some level with the most productive of those events. Yeah, and those events um, for smaller cities are just as critical for those smaller cities um, that you might argue for some of the larger cities that uh, clearly have bigger impacts. So we have to be careful that as we're spreading the funds around that we don't, I mean, there might be, I always think about, you know, in some areas we're going to have to do it by size and then some of the money just by events so that we do happen to, you know, nurture some of the, if we're going to go down this path, and I think you're right, Mayor, about having a finite budget and, you know, maybe half of that budget goes by size of project and the other half kind of gets split up so that we are at least touching uh, all points of contact within the, within the county. Um, and so, anyway, uh, Phil, you, you had your hand up. And then I'll get back to you. Um, I agree with Mayor Kreisman. The follow-up on uh, Mr. Crowder's comment about the Grand Prix, a little historical perspective. Um, we negotiate what we get for the dollars we're putting out, and I think the ask for the Grand Prix was too much. We wanted this, we wanted that, we wanted that. We were only giving them the, this much. And they looked at it from a strictly math and said, well, we can sell those things somewhere else and make a lot more. So they said, thanks, we're, on, we're good. And they backed out because we were asking for too much is what it boils down to. Now, it does stand on its own. It doesn't necessarily need our funding to, to, to work, but that was, I think, the problem that happened. We tried to negotiate for too much for the dollars we were willing to spend, and they looked at it from strictly a business standpoint, and it wasn't a good business decision, so they backed out. Um, with regard to, you know, numbers of people and room nights, uh, again, historically, uh, when these guidelines were first developed, it was uh, so many um, attendees or so many room nights. And then we put them together and said we had to have all these attendees and all these room nights, and that made it much stricter uh, and harder for an event to get qualified uh, for the funding. And maybe it's time to look at not so much the return on investment from room nights, but are there other day trippers coming from other counties for these festivals? Is it big mm -hmm. enough? And is it, a, is it, is it not only uh, beneficial for tourism, but is it beneficial for better quality of life for the, for the community? And I think that's where this kind of needs to go is somewhere a hybrid in between there to support a few more things that are quality of life. Um, well, I've got the floor. I'll go ahead and, and suggest a couple of things. Um, or do some comparisons to the capital projects funding. Uh, I mentioned this like last month and the month before, that um, it, the capital project for a $5 million grant or less, you're required to show 25,000 paid or documented attendees and 10,000 room nights per year. Well, that's very similar to category two of the elite, which we give 75,000 for. If you take the five million divided by 75,000, that's 66 and two thirds years that we expect to get out of that capital project. I don't think we can expect 60 some years out of anything we're doing. I think we're doing those things because it's, it's better for the community and it's a, a, we see it as, a, as an ad. We wanna see it uh, flourish, so we're gonna help it out. Um, so if we're looking at these categories and these numbers that have to be created and you compare those two, they're way out of whack, I think. So that's why I think we need to ease the uh, requirements for the elite funding without getting too easy <laughs> and opening the door to too many things, as Mayor Hibbert was saying. I agree with that. Again, historically, it was new product development, then it was special event grant, and it got out of hand. It got every little weekend fest local festival was applying for dollars, and then the Great Recession came along, and we had to cut back, so we eliminated the program. We brought it back. Uh, at my suggestion as the elite funding. So only the bigger events, or the ones that had an impact, a significant impact to the county or to a particular municipality of the size. And that's where we came up with the guidelines, which then ended up getting stricter. And now we're looking at, I think what we all agree to is we maybe need to separate room nights from attendees and have you do one or the other, and maybe you do both, it's great. But, and uh, also look at the amount of money 
we're willing to pay out to these events uh, given that metric, you know, um, to make it more in line with what the capital projects funding would be. Okay. If that makes any sense. There's a whole lot there, sorry. <laughs> okay. Russ? Um, I agree with what the, what's being said, and I think that we need to emphasize more on the marketing side and the value of it, whether it's local or state or national or global, uh, than, than uh, the room nights itself that we tried to put on it. And I always worry that we hit those room nights for any event there, that goes on. Uh, and also the, the direction that it's going. It's, it's, it's a startup and it's going forward and it's the marketing side that makes it happen that is a whole new area to bring in more people. Uh, and then there's events that when we did this, I would say that the words weren't even used. And I'm thinking of uh, uh, the Harley uh, one that we had. When we did these 20 years ago or whatever it was, we didn't even think about Harleys uh, coming in and making an impact of 30,000 people or whatever it is that stayed over and all too. So it's kind of those, uh, we just finished the LPGA and Bel Air it was. It was awesome. And it was advertising and marketing and I saw it on television and everything. And it's just getting started. And I think that's what we got to look at is that growth in those things and, and newness and repeat in the marketing side versus the room night side. And these cultural things <laughs> Uh, are away. I just, I have a family came in for a few rooms at my hotel um, Saturday, and it was a sangria event in Clearwater that I didn't even know anything about. And they drove in 300 miles for it and then raved about it. And it was room nights. And so maybe that's a little event, but maybe it'll grow into something more in November in the time of year we need it. So I think the marketing side, the time of the year, and, and everything, and a little bit the emphasis of room nights is the way we need to be adjusting, just like the mayors and all are saying. Thank you, Russ. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so two things. First, on, on the Grand Prix, uh, Phil was right. Um, that's exactly my understanding of what happened, too, is uh, what, what was being requested of the uh, organization um, as far as services and, and promotions that they would do for what they were receiving was less than if they had just done it themselves and sold it. Uh, and so they said it's not worth our time and effort and going through all this. And then the other piece that, that they complained about, and it's one of the things that I wanted to talk about today too, was you know, they come in front of the, the committee, they make their presentation, they've done all the prep work, the committee makes a recommendation of dollars and then it goes, and this is no disrespect meant to staff, but then it goes to staff who then on their own negotiates what, what, what you're gonna give us and then we'll decide how much money we're gonna give you and then that goes to the BCC. So they feel like, well, wait a minute, why did I waste all my time and effort and coming in front of the committee and making this whole presentation when the committee made a recommendation of money that I'm not ever, ever gonna see? And so they just said, that's it, we're done. Uh, and you think about the value to the CVB of seeing Visit St. Pete Clearwater on national television for three and a half hours that we miss out on. Um, that's a huge miss. And it's something that I think we really need to, to take a hard look at as to how we're setting this up, this process up, that we have organizations like that that say, it's not even worth my time. Would I like the money? Sure, but it's not worth it because I can sell it on my own and get more. Um, I think Frank is absolutely right on the, uh, going back to the uh, cultural heritage, and I still think moving away from that definition is the way we ought to go, but we ought to maybe look at setting a, a set amount, and then, you know, even under the funding categories right now, it just talks about unique paid visits. It doesn't talk about room nights, which I think is good, but potentially looking at how much do we give based on what's the attendance. Uh, and I know in your um, discussion areas, you've listed a number five category, which is new events. And I do think that 
um, that it would fall under community impact and you have a different requirement if it's a new event as far as what their expected attendance would be. And then if they're not growing, they're not gonna get more money. Um, but give them something to start out with so at least we can, we can start to develop new events uh, because I think that's important too. So th this category, I think we've got a lot of opportunity to, to really massage it and make it into something that fits better. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Mayor Bujowski, did, did I miss somebody? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I too agree with um, Mayor Christman again, because um, my notes here is exact, almost exactly what you said, but you know, I, I think we can all, especially the long timers that have been on this board for a long time or, or staff, I'm sure, have heard over and over and over again this sort of, our, the questions always ask, well, are we gonna, f Grand Prix, for instance, or PGA, whatever, Valspar, are we funding that event forever? Is that what we're doing? I've heard county commissioners say that. Or is our role to do it for a certain number of years and, and get them started? And nobody has ever been able to answer that question, right? So I'm not saying we're gonna solve that question today, but I do think having two categories and trying to answer that question once and for all will make your concern that you brought up go away, essentially. Um, and I don't wanna get off, too far off topic, but um, I think supporting new events, if they're, I think if an event fits into our strategic plan, let's say, I'll just use that as an example, and, and there could be a hundred examples I could give, but in our, in our plan for our marketing coming up this year, right, we're gonna be marketing to the arts, right? Main sale, or art harvest in Dunedin, or whatever, you know, those are events that support our marketing plan coming up in the next year. Now. Do they draw overnight rooms? I don't know, probably not, but they might definitely draw um, you know, regional attendance. So I think by using what's our strategic plan, what are our goals, what are, what, what are we marketing to, what's the specialty we're marketing to in the coming year, and if there are events that fit that, that niche that we're doing, why would we not support them? Because it's supporting our overall goal of the organization and who we're trying to attract. That, that could be a metric, maybe. You know, that's, that's one idea. Um, I also agree with uh, Mayor Hibbard. You know, <laughs> we just went through this exercise of giving some of our ARPA money to events, ongoing events in our city this, this last year or for the next year to get them going, right? 400,000 we invested. There was something like 30 some events. So uh, we're just one small city as compared to you know the rest of the county. So I agree, we have to have some metrics that are gonna sort of lay out whatever this cultural heritage category, whatever it flips to. There's gonna have to be something, but it has to be, those metrics have to be at least obtainable. You know, they can't be too far out of reach for everyone except the larger cities. Because I think what um, Chairman Eggers said has value as well. So I, you know, I would look to you, Steve, to try to, I don't have to solve that right here, and I don't think we do, but I think you understand the intention. Um, and I do think um, having this category that with a change of a name, and, and maybe having a category that is new events that we think fill part of our plan. We're trying to go somewhere in these, these particular events. But I think we have to answer the question, do we fund something forever? Yeah. I'm not, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Like I don't have a problem funding the, the race event. I know it brings value. I don't have a problem with funding things if they're really bringing value. But there's, there's been that debate, so. Yeah, yeah I mean when you talk about uh, the new LPGA event that you mentioned, and you talk about the 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 race, and you if you had to pick one or the other based on like the original intention here, which was called a new product funding, you'd pick the LPGA event because you're trying to get it up and running. The, the race is already going, but and then it, and then it talks about a new product funding, which then became special events 
funding and is now operated under the elite funding so it's kind of like i think we do need a category of these new projects that have those criteria that we've been talking about and continue to fund those up and maybe they leave that category and come over into this ongoing um, event category that, that that recognizes important events throughout our county um, and again i just think we have to be careful as to how how long do you do that and does it move from the new product the new event to this category and then at some point just kind of says okay we've done they're doing great and we don't need to have the requirements and they don't need or as you said we get three to three hours of and does that fit what we're trying to do from a strategic planning standpoint so it's complicated um, and i think it's great to be having the conversation that we're having um, but i do think there's a place for these events that don't that you know again don't necessarily fit so um that actually oh i'm so sorry no that's fine no um thank you very much i uh, echo uh, much of this i like uh, the consensus that we're hearing uh, from everyone especially when it comes to calling things unique room nights because i think there's a lot of potential room nights that come from a lot of these events uh, the one that's near and dear to my heart starts tomorrow which is the sand innovations event and i've been involved with that for 13 years it um started on a shoestring budget and i can say that when they received some funding um, from the tdc or from the county it made a huge difference in not the event growing because it's it's well it did grow but it's been very successful from day one um, but the exposure outside of the immediate region really grew because we, they were able to market that better. Uh, we get people that come throughout the year that discovered us because of that event. And I think those are very difficult to, to measure. And when you, you put these high room nights and call them unique, it, it's very difficult to get that true measurement because are they there just for that or did they discover us because of that and now they're gonna come back. Um, this week alone, we're going to be on three. The event's going to be covered by three major networks um, that's going to be broadcasting as far as Orlando. And it's just great exposure for it. So I think looking at the bigger picture of what can it bring in, and that may be the smaller events, and certainly it's the major elite events, um, but it brings us throughout the year additional business. Anybody that I, did I miss? Somebody? Yes. Uh, Commissioner, if I may, just a couple of comments that hopefully will help uh, guide you, um, the group. Um, Grand Prix, I think, was one of the events that stopped applying as well when we went from 250000 to the lesser amount. I think that was part of it because at one point, Category 1 got up to $250,000, and that was reduced. As to Mayor Bajalski's comment, we did at one point, these guidelines have been revised innumerable times. At one time, we did sunset the funding, and then that was revised yet again to take that away because of the debate. So that is still obviously something that this board could recommend going back and reinstituting a sunset so you're not funding some of these events forever. But that's, again, a policy call. The other thing that I wanted to make sure was clear is the guidelines as currently drafted and as recommended uh, in the past to make sure staff, uh, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing as far as these are up to amounts. So when these recommendations are made, it's not like automatically if you're a category, you get that full amount. So it, staff was charged with making sure that we're getting the best bang for our buck, if you will. And that's how the guidelines are written. They could be rewritten if you want set amounts whatever category that can be done as well but just to make sure that that's not on staff um the other thing to keep in mind is that the whole genesis of this is that these dollars are supposed to be spent to attract tourists so room nights is a key to this and the last thing i will say is that category four which is a cultural heritage event has no room night requirement to begin with so I know there's been some confusion about that, but that already currently, there's never been a requirement for room nights there. But generally, whenever you're looking at spending these dollars, you wanna keep in mind the goal of the statute is attracting tourists, and tourists are defined as people who rent hotel rooms, so to speak, or transient accommodations. Anyway, Commissioner, I just wanted to kind of make those points because I know this gets very heavy with a lot of the details, but thank you. Okay, thank you, Michael. Any other comments especially after uh, Michael's perspective anything 
Yeah, Mayor. Uh, the only other comment, and, and I didn't know if we were moving off of the uh, definitions and funding categories um, or not, so I, if, no, we're, if we're, we're open. I okay, was trying open. to be patient over here because I'm, I'm jumping to the next thing too. <laughs> uh, in, in the application process and review, um, you know, one of the things that we score uh, based on here is, um, where is it? Um, I know we, we score based on, there, there we go, um, sponsorship benefits. So we're, we're already expecting whoever's applying for funding to, to talk, I would think, about what it is that they're offering to, to, to the CVB in exchange for getting this money. Uh, and so when the committee is reviewing that, that's when they have, if, if, if they have the opportunity, it seems to me, that if they don't feel that the the benefit versus what's being asked for is enough, then they can give them a low score on that. Uh, but then, after we've now required the business or the, the organization or the entity to tell us what they're gonna give, we then, again, I'm going back to what I said before, we then send it to staff to start negotiating that. Um, and so, I mean, I think that it, it, it's creating a redundant step, number one. Uh, and two, if, if if we didn't like the sponsorship benefit that they were offering, then they're not gonna get as much money right off the bat. And that's the purpose of the, the committee to come to that decision. So I, I feel, I, I just felt like the, the way this process is set up, the committee to some degree is a little bit, all the efforts that they put in is a little bit neutered or watered down because it's then sent to staff who then ultimately makes the decision that may be contrary to what the committee found. So. I, I think it ought to be one or the other. Um, I was just thinking that, um, you know, when we put that committee together, um, we normally don't have staff on that committee, do we? It's normally a group here. Um, staff sits there, but they're, don't, they're not voting on it. Yeah, so I'm wondering maybe a, a, a participating member or two at that meeting might be, you know, a way to bridge this, this kind of divide approach so that when they do leave that, that that piece has been kind of incorporated already because I'd like I'd like to think that we know what we're doing, but that the staff may know better. Mm. And if they if they're presenting that at that meeting, that then it kind of maybe does it cuts yeah. down on some of the redundancy. Uh, Mayor Bajowski. I actually have a slightly a different thought because I have done the committee the last couple of years and found it to be really cumbersome and in, in the end, it ends up changing depending on which way the wind blows. Um, but what I found myself as a committee member doing was constantly calling staff to ask questions about certain things. And as an elected official, which is I know is different than folks that aren't, we generally go through, somebody would go through some application process, they would go to our staff, our team, who are our experts, they know did these people meet their uh, proposed objectives last year if they were, you know, an ongoing event? Were they easy to work with? Did we get good value out of it? Yada, yada, yada. There's all kinds of questions, right, that can be asked. They know the value of certain, of certain marketing efforts. Um, so I, I actually feel that the, the staff at Visit St. Pete Clearwater, the people that have done the negotiating over the years, and I, I know that person isn't with us anymore, but I think they should be looking at this and ranking it and making some recommendations based on what they know they can get out of it and have those discussions before they even come to us. I don't know that we have to have a committee. I think they can come right here to the full board. Now, we can, doesn't mean we don't ask questions and question it, I think we are, I think the process is convoluted because we don't have their recommendations before it gets here. That's what I think is causing the problem. I think you could, can talk to these people, negotiate. Now maybe there's a, if there's a brand new event, right, you, let's see, create that category and there's a brand new event, maybe you might wanna say, hey, here's some ideas for some new events. Are you interested in hearing more? You might wanna come to the board and ask them, before you spend time on it, but 
I think you, you all need to do the scoring based on professional assessment. And then maybe it's not even for a decision, it's a work session that we have. And then you have to go back and answer some things. But I think that would solve a lot of the problems that both the applicant and the person who's on the committee feel as they're going through it. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, yeah I, I guess to the concerns that Mayor Christman brought up, when you put it, you know, when you put it in, in the, their hands first, is that what you're, you're basically saying? Yes. That you're gonna end up losing out, uh, discouraging people. I, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm I, and I, I understand the flip side to it is the way we're doing it now, there's no connection. So you, you, we're doing all of this, and then we throw it to the professionals and they kind of do their thing. Um, or maybe they, we don't even do that, we bring it back here, and then we throw it to the professionals and it's Well, a you know, I, I do wanna add, Dave, that um, the last two times that I, or three, whatever it's been, um, Tim Ramsberger has sat here and answered every question we gave him throughout the process. So there was, staff members here to answer our questions. Yeah. They just, but maybe they role. refuse to advise, if yeah, you will. Maybe. And I don't mean that in a bad way, refuse, but I mean they, they felt like it wasn't their place to do that. And, and I think that's missing. Well, and maybe that's what we, we can redefine their role. I mean, we, it, it, they're sitting around this room as part of the quote committee and having the dialogue and, and having a different in, role, so to speak, I think would be might be more productive and better and um, I don't know. I mean, we're talking about one way or the other. Um, I, so I, I'm a little bit concerned about turning it all over first and then bringing it back. And I kind of like the way we do it a little bit now, but I think to have a, that reality dose up front makes some sense too. Um, and if, they, if they're more participants rather than just answering questions, because uh, they know what they're gonna be doing down the road, so to speak, or Presumably, I don't know. Um, um, any additional thoughts on that? No, sounds, yeah, Phil? Uh, perhaps we could have staff to do a preliminary review of what the, what the request is, <coughs> or what their application looks like, and then <coughs> mentor them some, somewhat to say, look, you're lacking here. You're gonna need to show more here or more back up there before it gets presented to the committee, and I agree that a staff member should be one or two, maybe should be on the, the review committee. But maybe there is, and maybe that's going on already. Maybe the, the staff is giving them some guidance on where they're deficient in their application or how they're not gonna, you know, cut it unless they do more here or more there. It's just a possible suggestion. Yeah, Steve, I just, yeah, I think it's a good point. Did you, uh, were you listening there? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think we need to, well, go ahead. So actually you guys have hit every topic that I felt was important in this discussion. Even though we, we were all over the place, it's actually hit every, every topic. Um, so I'm glad to see that at least my uh, mind meld here is happening um, on, on this part. If I could real quickly go through on the, the participative standpoint of the review process. You know, and, and I look at it from, from two different ways. And, and I've, I've done, in my previous position north of here, um, we actually as staff graded everything and then presented it to our board of directors and said based on, here's, here's all the details, you have every application, you have ev all, everything's been answered, this is how we graded it, um, do you have questions of the applicants and they're there if they needed it, um, and are you supportive of moving forward as is? If there are there changes you'd like to see made, and it was done. But they used the, the staff, and we, between our ad agency and an internal staff, that's how the decisions were made. You know, so I, so again, I think for us being, we'll, we talk about it now internally, but w what what I would look at doing is to say, well, wait a minute, if you go through looking at data, Again, data helps in the decision process. If we go back and say, all right, they have this kind of impact, economic impact in the community, this many people, this much in spending, look at the different ways to measure it. Here are the answers to it. And based on 
you know, set criteria that's right there that literally the answer is right, right in front of you, it becomes easier to go through and say, you know what, this makes sense, and here's, here's the, the, the reason why. And then you as a body are going to be able to look at that and say, I totally agree. No, I don't. I think we need to look at it from that. I think moving it from committee and going directly to the TDC gets rid of one step, which then makes it repetitious. And really just you, you take one of our meetings and we say on um, this, we're going to as a whole going to have a meeting and we're going to discuss elite events and here's all the applicants and all the different categories, et cetera. So, there's again the mind has just a bunch of stuff up here and i was so glad to see each of you you know, uh, touch upon those things the room night you know I, I still think is important but i think what's more important is when you talk about how many jobs again yeah here's a report from a, an event and they talk about this event supported this many jobs in the in the in pinellas county what were the taxes generated that was beyond TDT, that's all tax. Um, what was the direct spend? So spending in the communities. So looking at those things, I think go through and give a bigger picture of an event um, and, and, and how it's impacting us. And that overnight guest, you can still go through and say um, the fact that somebody was visiting here because of the event. And guess what? If they're a new visitor, more than likely we're going to get them as a repeat visitor at some point you know it's at some point down down the road and i do like the name change out of cultural heritage to and I, i'm calling it more of quality of life or quality of place because one of the things that i know we talk about is the vibe the the vibe that you know pinellas county has and the events make up that vibe it's one of the things that we have and and it differs by community, which is why I wanted to have a new event. You know, again, our role as tourism development is how do we help make things happen? And is this a way to make something happen? You know what? Maybe it's a first year event and it just rocks. Next thing you know, you're able to get them into a, a different program. And in the same sense, we have events that take place over time. Um, a, again, previous employment, what we looked at was a sunset. However, the, what we said is we would sunset the grant process, but we would move to a marketing support role. And, and again, over a period of time. Now, I left before they, they fully implemented that program. Um, but again, think about it from this standpoint. If I am uh, you know, a particular event and, they, uh, and it, it sunsets after X amount of years, well, now there's a marketing role to that. And again, that's that visibility out, outside, outside the, the area. Um, and then the last thing really was looking at the number, and Phil, I'm glad you brought up the, the room night part of it, but you know, if you have 25,000 room nights is what you're saying your event is going to do, and it's over a weekend, and the, if you look at what the average party size is, and then you look at how many nights on average they stay, a 25,000 room night event is basically gonna occupy about 4,500 room, rooms in the county, which is about 20% of our room inventory. So is that realistic? Um, especially when you look at, um, you know, when we go back and look at what a Super Bowl did, you know, yeah, so it's putting things more into perspective in, or what I would say more realistic in the numbers and, and revisiting it. So I know I just did a garbage dump, um, but it's in conjunction with what everyone is saying, um, which, I, which I, I think is, is great. And so I've been taking diligent notes here. Chuck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if you look at the elite funding program um, on the summary page, if we go back to 16, we spent a million 425 and a million five, so we're going up. And then we, were we over negotiating? We went to a million two. Yes, um, Michael brought up that we did go from 250 max to 125, so that, that certainly has something to do with it. But then we go to 619. 19 was pre COVID. Um, so we're just, even though our, our tourism, we've watched every year, is going record number, record number, now we're spending less and less on these events and this year for instance um, in 2021 um, we budgeted a million dollars we only spent half of our budget um, so I, I still would love to see 
um, us spend virtually all of our budget. That's, that's what it's for. We have a, a tourist that comes to the beach, and, and if we didn't have an event, they're going to stay on the beach and have a great time. If we have a I'll just festival of speed, so now they're going to pick up and leave the beach, and now they're going to spend more money than they would have having a couple drinks on the beach at those events. So we are increasing the, um, the taxes that are collecting by the county, sales tax, um, not necessarily bed tax. Um, and so there's an additional direct spend there. So my, my, my question maybe to Jim is, how do we come up with a million dollars, for instance, this year was our budget for elite events versus going back in 16, and obviously the mu budget must have been at least a million 425, if not more. Um, so where does the million dollars come from? Is it a percentage or? Um, Phil, did you, did you, are you going to shed some light on that? Um, Jim? <clears throat> the, the plan allows us to spend up to two million. When we developed this back over 10 years ago or roughly 10 years ago, but on um, two million dollars was the amount that's allowed to be spent on uh, elite events. And we've never spent that. Uh, but if you look at the, 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 the budget for this fiscal year that we were given earlier today, and you look at page one, almost at the bottom promotion, we have elite events, and it, the, the 2021 budget was on this line item a million dollars. We may be able to go to two million, but the line item here says only a million. Well, it's only, and that's, that's what Tim would probably come up with based on history of, of participation. So we're not going to allocate $2 million every year and, and try and spend it if we don't think we're going to have events that are going to apply for it. The, the, his best guess was we'll, we'll probably be able to spend a million at the most, so that's what we'll budget. And, um, and I appreciate I'm just saying that, that the $2 million was what we came up with 10 years ago, and that was okay. a much bigger percentage of our overall <laughs> Yeah, here we are now at $72.5 million, $73.5 so million. I'm in agreement that we need to spread it around a little more, and, maybe, and we need, in order to do that, we need to ease it somewhat, and we need to do what you're talking about, look at, okay, overall impact, not just, you know, room nights is important, yes, but participation is also important. If they're day trippers, if they're bringing revenue, if they're creating jobs, uh, we need to look at that element and allow more applicants to come in and we need to support them. Um, as far as the, the perpetual, <laughs> some have great marketing benefits like the Grand P could have. Um, we want to hang on to those and we want to continue to support them so we can get the benefit from that market. Other events require sponsorship from a city, and sponsorship from a title sponsor, and sponsorship in the form of a grant from the TDC to exist to make the thing work because it's not profitable enough on its own to exist without those key sponsorship elements. So we need to keep in mind about those things. And maybe your point that you're doing is sunset them possibly, but with the idea that you're going to continue to to get the marketing benefit to help them because it is a good event. It's been there year over year and it's a great thing. We should support it and it would be automatic that way outside of a review process. And we've done that to a point with the, with the um, <clears throat> creation of the longstanding events get automatically pushed on through. But uh, you know, that could be another way to do it was say, okay, this is, you're going to move you out of this category and we're going to actually support you with marketing on, the, on the, another area to make room for other events to come in that we can explore. Um, and again, I, hold on one second. I mean, I just want to, I want to be cognizant of the time. I really do want to get you guys out of here at, at 1130. Uh, we're going to pick this up a little bit next month. Uh, again, continue the dialogue. Um, and just, and again, I, I think in some ways, I mean, I, I have not been as intimately involved, obviously, as you all have in looking at this elite funding, but I'm looking at just the top line, the PGA, the Valspar event, was 250 for three years and then went to 125. And just, you know, again, again, when you look at the numbers, it went from 1.2 million um, in the event down to $600,000 just in that one year. And it says here, these are the new event funding guidelines that took effect in 2019. So uh, again, I'm, I'm not sure of the, the mo you know, where we were at that time and why we dropped it, that we said we needed to drop it. Um, or was it just that that's what the, the projects were at the time? I, I, I don't know. But back to some of the comments of, well, we need to spend the budget that we have. And if we do create a new category, uh, a category four that's a, a new events, and we keep the others the way they are, and we deal with the sunset issue, um, 
you know, I mean, there may be a, there may be some opportunities to, to to match that budget number. And Jim, only thing I would ask you is is there was there any direction as it related to 2020 budget and 2021 budget um, what we were budgeting versus what I mean, was there a pressure to try to minimize that as much as possible during the downturn, or did, is it just that we didn't come up with the projects? FY21, um, we they, they cut <coughs> staff cut budgets across many departments or many divisions within CBB, uh, and I think there was a lack of applications for projects. Some of the some of the data you might be looking at uh, could be actuals that were spent and and uh, events were canceled because of COVID, so they didn't ask for reimbursements so we didn't spend it. Um, you know, it, it's. The one million dollars, <clears throat> excuse me. The one million dollars that was budgeted for FY21 is a, a number that staff looked at their budget and decided that's that was enough. And I don't believe we even received a million dollars worth of request uh, for that year. So it, it, it's it's a number that staff looks at based on what they're hearing from uh, previous applicants, and it, it's a number that they come up with. And when I say staff, I mean uh, CBB staff. Yeah. Well, if we up to this new category, get ready. I mean, you know, well, <laughs> as you know, it, it, we have the authority, I guess, to budget up to two million dollars, and that, it's just part of their overall budget. It's yeah. it's not a separate budget within their sixty percent, so it's all under that sixty percent uh, right. figure that we use each year between operating and capital. Mayor, did you have something? Yeah, I, you know. <clears throat> Having been on this board for many years and then taking an eight-year hiatus, we're ever changing this because we get an example that's a bad example of an event that may not get funded or got overly funded, and then we tweak it. I mean, I think we're in a situation of perfect is the enemy of good enough, and I don't like using that term very often because I don't believe in mediocrity. But, you know, I also don't believe in ending, in sunsetting some of the great events that we have. I mean, there are premier events that should continue to be funded going forward. I think you are about to open the floodgates. Um, I can promise if everybody's going to start throwing in events, you know, I'm going to have a list for you. Uh, and I think that can be dangerous. Now, I just want to point that out as a cautionary tale. Yeah, I, I, I think it is, it is concerning. I mean, I think we have some good ideas here about projects that we all could, this is one that really makes a big difference to this city or to that city and, and how we manage that process. Um, you know, we're going to get 100 new, 100 new applications under new events or, or ones that don't meet the other categories that, um, um, and you know, sifting through those and bringing them up for consideration, and um, and maybe maybe I'm making more out of it. Maybe there wouldn't be a hundred projects, but I think to your point, Mayor, I think your city's going to have it. I know Dunedin's going to have it. Oldsmar's going to have it. Tarpon Springs, and certainly St. Petersburg. With you know, and, and, and that's that's meant in only complimentary way. It's just the biggest city here, so it's going to have more events, and it tends to, you know, pull those dollars so i think we have to be again careful of that um phil did you have something and then i just want to echo mayor hibbert's uh, comment there again historically it was new product then special event and then it got out of hand and we had too many small events applying for things that really didn't have a whole lot to do with tourism it was just a weekend festival at a local so i echo his concern with opening it up too wide and i just want you to take one word and that is elite <laughs> That's what this is for, it's for events. This is elite events. This is not every little festival, every little gathering. Uh, so when we go to open it up a little bit, make sure that we're still looking at it from a elite standpoint. And I think that'll help resolve um, the possible issue of blowing it out of the water here. But when you say place. elite, Phil, you're talking about elite as a, with respect to Pinellas County as a whole. Yes. Because, because what might be elite in Oldsmar, for instance, may not rise up to elite in in st petersburg um, right so it, it, they do consider certain events as elite events we have to define what that is i guess here 
right. so we can. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's the concern that you know the mayor brings up. It's like, okay, so where do we cut it off, and you know, how do we handle it? Mayor Wojcicki. I agree with everything that's been said. Um, I, I think there can be some metrics applied or whatever. And I, I just to clarify, Steve, I think when you were talking about um, phasing out, I think you were maybe talking about the new events, not the ongoing events, or were you talking about all of them? I didn't have anything specific in okay. mind. I was just saying pre in a previous role, gotcha. that's what we did. And yeah, no, and take I it from there. I agree with our our major events. I, I, I don't see a need to phase those out. Um, but maybe when you're starting a new event, you know, and you're trying to build something, they should transition to another category once they get built. You know? Now if they can't transition to one of those other categories, then you probably do want to talk about whether you want to continue to fund them. Or maybe they only reached a niche for a period of time. But I think for the next meeting, I, I would like to see at least what you've heard today and come up with something that we can actually read before we get here to then spur further conversation. Yeah. Do we like what you've put on paper? That kind of thing. That's what I would like to see. Yeah, and I think at the end of the day, and I kind of put what you were saying, Phil, about elite. If communities come up with one elite event, you know, max per year. So the city of Clear, the city of St. Petersburg has that one elite event that they're gonna bring forward, but so does the city of Oldsmar or the city of Dunedin. And we look at their respective elite events in a different way, you know, and maybe that's a, a way we kind of cut through city of Clearwater coming up with 15 events to look at. Um, and again, I don't know how you, you know, how you separate that out, but I think if the cities are coming up with these requests, I mean, and again, it doesn't necessarily have to be a city request, but somehow to deal with that number, and we can't, we can't, we can't open this up and be overwhelmed with, with applications. So anyway, we'll have more discussion at the December meeting, um, uh, and I think this was a great start. So thank you for your thoughts on that. Any closing comments that we need to uh, deal with? Um, no, I just want to say thank you to everybody. I mean, great discussion. This is all good feedback uh, for us to review, and uh, we will get something together for uh, December. Phil? Well, that's common not to do with this, but uh, on the beach nourishment, if we could put that on the agenda again to talk about uh, <coughs> a beach nourishment reserve. Um, <coughs> We found out today that beach nourishment is allocated whatever the budget is, the rest of it goes back in the capital reserve. We've also talked about the potential future need for additional dollars, and I think that it would be good to have a discussion about changing or amending the plan uh, to allow us to separately put a reserve on that. Uh, I, I want to make sure you realize that there is $26 million in the capital fund reserved for beach programs. It's it doesn't come back to the TD, TDT fund. The, the capital fund has $26.2 million set aside for future beach projects. Okay. So it, it doesn't roll back to capital reserves. I don't want that impression out there. It is, you know, we send it to the capital fund, it stays there, and they use it as they need in the future. So it's not a spend everything at once. It's not our, it's not this reserve. It's Correct. A, it's, a, yeah. it's, a, it's a separate reserve. It, uh, it's it, a it's separate a, beach nourishment reserve, so the excess that we fund. didn't we had budget the, four million, and the proper percentage would have been six point one well, million. Well, yeah, if I mean, we That's budget, what I'm talking we, about that excess. Right, we spend what we budget, right. um, and that money gets sent to the capital fund, and they they don't use it all. They haven't used it all uh, yet. They have over twenty six million dollars that they have saved up. So okay. they, I don't want it to be. I don't want the impression to be that. We send it, they don't spend it, they send it back. No, They've no, I'm talking about the excess. I'm talking about that excess amount. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's a budgeting uh, issue. Uh, um, you know, we budget, we spend what we budget. We can't uh, spend more than what we budget. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it would have to be a process to, uh, to increase the budget, or you can do it in a, in a subsequent budget year um, to make I'd just a like difference. to see it go to it. To a reserve for that, but well, that 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 money will be set aside for these kinds of projects that Kelly's talking about. If we don't, if we can't get the outside funding, we have that 26 million to start 
as a matching point. Now, we may end up, and again, we're not there yet, but we may end up coming to a point where that 26 million may go real quickly, and we need to look at what we are contributing Correct. The, the here way, higher, the, as, at a higher level. But correct. The, the way the, the capital fund uses it is they use it as matching, the required matching funds for what right. the federal grants or state grants or whatever else. So it is our portion of the, of the expenditure. And I think Kelly was just saying there are some just questions on the horizon that right. might mean we have to readdress that. But I don't think staff's ready to do that yet. I haven't heard that. It, it's a budgeting. I mean, yeah. whatever the, uh, the board decides. Well, I understand, but I'm saying, but it also right. has to do with the grant applications. And, and, and the need. And if that becomes real ominous, like we're not going to be getting that, that $26 million will go pretty quickly. And that right. means we will have to address that here okay. and how much we, yeah. how much we give. Need to Doreen? Go through the whole um, on the same comment about this, you know, maybe I'm totally missing the point, but I think what Phil was saying is that if we budgeted and it, it this year became, was six point whatever, and we only put into the fund the four million, and there's that excess, it goes into, as I understand what Jim's saying, it goes into the capital fund. But why couldn't that difference go into the beach nourishment? Because it was earned. We had more money earned of that percent of the third cent or whatever. Is that, Phil, am I off? No. Yeah, I, OK. Yeah. So in, and then I heard you say earlier, once it goes into the capital fund, it, you'd have to do a budget amendment to, it, it's not easy to get it back over. So all I'm back over to what though? Back to the beach nurse. But that, that no, is the beach. That is the correct. beach that, fund. That, the the beach, the capital fund has lots of different projects in there, and one of the projects is beach renourishment. And there's 26 and million set aside for, just for that. that. And, that, and that's where it right. goes. And I understand what what uh, Mr. Henderson is asking about. If we had, if we had expended half of one of the percent, it would have been more than $4.3 million. But we budgeted $4.3 million, and in order to go over that, we would have to do a budget amendment, which is, it's possible, but it's not something we've done because we haven't uh, reduced funding in the past when, when we've fallen short of what we've budgeted. So, you know, it, it's a budgeting process, and the beach nourishment part of the cap of the CVB's capital program is expended every year. It's it's, it's when moved I say it, when over I, it, it's to transferred. it's moved yes, to transferred. the beach fund. Yeah. So I was just along that line thinking that if we did have that extra that was earned, would this not be an opportunity then to do a budget amendment to move it over so that you have more funds in there? and you're not having to adjust it every year because we did have shortfall, and I understand. Right. I, I mean, I would, it, it's, that's process-wise, it's possible, um, but there's, they don't have a need, they have $26 million, and they're not gonna spend that all. So if you wanna make it up in a future year when we do the budget, that is a, a question for the TDC and for the board to take up instead of budgeting the equivalent of half of one of the percents, you could do more than that. There's nothing that says you can't. Um, it's, you know, it, it's just a, a budgeting process. And, you know, I, if that's what but, is required, then that's what I would. But the monies that aren't spent in our, in our own budget here, uh, so to speak, goes into our own reserve. Correct. Okay. So that gets that money, get that extra money that we're talking about, that six million, that extra that right. To 1.7 or something. Right, the 4 million as you budgeted, that gets swept out and over to the capital account. Now you don't like that word, swept out. Um, um, it, it, it becomes part of the, the TDT funds capital reserves. The extra. Correct. Yeah. What, it, overall, I mean, whether it's operating or, or capital, it, it falls into the reserves. Um, so it's, it's more complicated than we can probably discuss here without charts right. and, and well uh, I tell you what why don't you uh, think about how to have that brief conversation okay. and, and show us at the next meeting yep. kind of 
meshing what you're talking about with some of the thoughts here, yep. okay? So that we are clear on the local reserve versus that capital reserve, that once it goes there, it's there. Yes, um, we can Versus the monies that we're keeping here and building, we have our own yes. account that's separate from that one. Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Rick, wow, your, and, I, your and I lied, obviously. Okay. It's like eight minutes past now. What? I'm asking when is Rick's last meeting? When is your last meeting? Next month? Yeah, he does. I think you, you, you're through January. Yeah, I mean, yeah. January 5th is my last day. Yeah. So, of course, he'll be here Not next month. Sure. <laughs> are, you, are you trying to get rid of him? No, no. 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 But I wanted to make sure we said goodbye if it was his last meeting. Yeah. Maybe a big present, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'm, I'm sorry we ran over, but, I, you know, again, good conversation, and I, and I just have to, have to let it be. So, um, any final thoughts? We have one minute. We lost our best ambassador for Pinellas County last week in winter, so kind of a sad time. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. Yeah, thank you for, for mentioning that. I know we've all had different thoughts and feelings about it and sit comments and, um, yeah, an amazing impact. Just, uh, and we probably don't even understand fully all the, you, know, you might, but. You can't believe the number of emails. Yeah, yeah. It's astounding. It's staggering. Uh, on emotional levels and financial levels and just, just you know, blowing away everything. Um, okay. Thank you again, everybody, for the last month and your participation. This meeting is adjourned. Happy Thanksgiving.